This is a coordinated activity happening across this nation. And so we are in a state of emergency. Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of the Chicago Dialogue series, presented by the University of Chicago Center in Delhi, <clears throat> in collaboration with Prohor.in. I am Deepesh Chakrabarti, a professor of history at the University of Chicago, and currently the faculty director of the Center in Delhi. Events in American politics have recently grabbed the attention of the world. We are very proud to present today my esteemed colleague, Professor Mark Hansen, from our political science department, in conversation with Mr. Abhik Chanda, a best-selling author and an acclaimed poet. It has been our privilege to have Mr. Chanda as the anchor and the host for this series. Mr. Chanda will formally introduce Professor Hansen. Welcome to you all again. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Dipeshta. And uh, to all our viewers across the world, a very warm welcome. And I think it's still fairly early enough in the year to, to say Happy New Year. So today's session is called Polarization and Pandemic. Now, when we look, at, look back at the year 2020, it's not just the year of the pandemic, but it's also been a really watershed one for American politics. All of that high drama leading up to the November 3rd US presidential election and then the equally dramatic, alarming aftermath of that US election, leading all the way up to Jan 20th, no less. This has raised some serious doubts about you know, the extraordinary powers that are invested in the, in the president, the deep level of polarization or schism in the American population today, and last but not the least, about how robust or fragile American, American democracy itself is. And to shed light on all of these questions, plus some, we have with us today, Professor Mark Hansen. So Professor Hansen is the Charles L. Hutchinson Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Political Science and the College. Previously, he has served as the Dean of the Division of Social Sciences, also as Chair of the Political Science Department, as Associate Provost for Education and Research, and also as a senior advisor to the university's president. From 2016 to 2017, he was the faculty director of the university's center in Delhi. Professor Hansen's research essentially focuses on legislative politics, interest group politics, citizen activism, and public opinion. He's the author of several books, including Mobilization, Participation, and Democracy in America, which he co-authored with Stephen Rodenstone, and Gaining Access, Congress and the Farm Lobby, 1919 through 1981. His most recent book that was published in 2019 is called City in a Garden, a historical guide to Hyde Park and Kenwood. Professor Hansen, Mark, a very warm welcome to the show. Yes, good evening. How are you? All great. So Mark, um, and this is something that we were talking about um, the last time when we were having a conversation, is uh, all of us, I think, including all our viewers who are watching, would definitely have been glued onto their TV sets during the inauguration on Jan 20th, right? But notwithstanding all the promises of hope and respect and empathy and unity, and beyond the stirring poetry, for there was a, some of it, and the riveting musical performances. Beyond all that, I think it's fair to say 
that there was still the specter of January the 6th looming large over the Capitol. And let me then start with a very fundamental essential question, then, Mark. How did we even come to this point? How did we even end up here? Well, I would say that what happened this January was absolutely unprecedented in American politics. So we have had many, many uh, situations in the past where we've been deeply divided uh, and where nevertheless the power passed from one party to the other party uh, without really any serious uh, resistance uh, on the part of the incumbent. Um, so starting with John Adams, uh, who was a Federalist and associated with uh, George Washington, uh, and who was bitterly opposed to Thomas Jefferson, although they became uh, friends later in life, but bitterly opposed to Thomas Jefferson, um, he set the pattern uh, that when the country votes for somebody else, you give way um, and you let that person become president. Uh, what happened this year was uh, unprecedented because we've never had a president before um, who has not willingly given way uh, to the people's choice. Um, in every prior case, in Adams's case, also in the case of James Buchanan, who gave way to Abraham Lincoln, um, they have recognized that the people have spoken and they've given way. And this year we had a president uh, who simply was not willing to leave office, uh, was not willing to uh, consider that he had lost the election. Um, I guess there are two things that have brought us uh, to that. Um, one is that it's the, that Donald Trump in his term has taken advantage of uh, a situation in American politics of intense polarization, of deep divisions between Republicans and Democrats, uh, mm -hmm. to the point that Republicans and Democrats um, actually think about, you know, would I be able to actually marry someone who is from the opposite party? Um, the people who said, absolutely not, no way, uh, has just gone up tremendously. Um, and so Trump exploited that. Uh, he exploited that basically to wrap a bunch of Republicans around his own particular interests. Um, the second thing that we've observed is that um, just how important it has been through time to have a set of norms of democratic governance in the United States um, and had a set of leaders who have been willing to observe those norms. Um, so what's really been tested over the last four years uh, uh, and which has been has, has raised real concerns, I think, in American politics um, is what happens when you have people who aren't willing to abide by those norms? Um, what are the things that can actually constrain them? And, the, and it turns out that um, uh, what a lot of people thought was behind those norms, namely that a president who violated them um, in the way that Trump has would be punished. Um, there, there is no punishment. Exactly. Exactly, which is which is quite sort of terrifying in itself. Mm -hmm. um, we talked. You talked about President Trump refusing to acknowledge that the people have spoken, right? Mm -hmm. And and he of course went far beyond that. Up until the time that Twitter and Facebook blocked his accounts, his his own social media pages were propaganda machines. And mm -hmm. over and above that, he has been backed by his own partisan sort of media houses. And all of this together, right, collectively have managed to influence people and really convince them, even now, you know, post the, the transition and the handover of power, that this election was rigged, that it was stolen from the uh, outgoing president, Trump, right? Uh, let's let's beyond the rhetoric right and beyond all the rants if we take a step back and look at it objectively dispassionately <coughs> and say all right let's assume a state like pennsylvania it was really rigged because this was one of the, the hugely contested states and so many different lawsuits which of course they, they lost the the Trumplicans. what does it take to actually rig an election in a state as, as large and as diverse as pennsylvania well, it's almost impossible. Um, so a couple of days after the election, I published an op-ed in the New York Times where I went through this carefully. Uh, the original title of the op-ed was, uh, let's get real about vote fraud. Uh, and the basic point was to, to commit fraud in a way that would actually uh, influence the outcome of a presidential election, not just in the nation, but in the state, was just an enormous undertaking. Um, mm -hmm. So, for instance, you would have to start in advance. It's not the kind of thing you're going to throw together in a day or two. 
Um, it's something that's going to take weeks and weeks at least and probably months and months. Um, and so it requires a great deal of foresight, foresight uh, to know uh, where it's going to come down, uh, where, where the crucial states are going to be uh, in terms of winning the Electoral College. Um, beyond that, it, it takes a lot of votes. Um, you're not going to be able to swing it by getting your 10 best friends each to go out and vote 10 times, even if that's possible. Um, it's going to require tens of thousands of votes. Um, so uh, Pennsylvania ended up being decided by 82,000 votes. 1% um, uh, of the 2016 election was 65,000 votes. And if you ask, well, what, what would it take to come up with 65,000 votes? Well, you're not going to get it spontaneously. There aren't going to be 65,000 people uh, who wake up and say, boy, if I voted twice, um, I could throw this election to, uh, to Joe Biden. Uh, rather, you're going to have to have an organized effort. Uh, and that organized effort is going to involve people who are willing to put themselves at risk of detection and prosecution for vote fraud. Um, and it's going to involve uh, recruiting people into the effort uh, who aren't going to squeal on you. Um, so there are lots of criminal conspiracies out there, and many of them come undone because either people want to brag about it, or people have a guilty conscience, um, or because you contact the wrong people and they don't want to participate at all. Um, and so it, it would just take an enormous uh, amount of effort. Um, you'd have to have dozens of people coordinating this effort, um, and they would have to be coordinating the efforts of thousands of people. Um, and so it's, it's an undertaking that just uh, isn't worth it. Uh, as the numbers go up, the probability of detection goes up. Uh, and as the numbers go up, uh, and as the stakes go up in a presidential election, the probability that you actually be prosecuted um, and sent to prison for participating in such a thing go up as well. Right. Okay. And and here they were talking about this across what more than half a dozen of the states, right? That they'd probably done this. That was the yeah. allegation. Right? It was not just Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania was one of those, but that wasn't clearly. Georgia being another one, of course, right? Oh, oh yes, yes. Um, I, the, the closest states ended up being Georgia, uh, Arizona, um, and the um, and Nevada, and, and then the uh, Nebraska Congressional District, where there was a single vote. So those three states changing would have changed the outcome of the election. Um, but of course, you don't know that in advance. Um, and the larger the number of states where you're trying to actually influence the election, the greater the risks and the greater the extent of the effort. Mm -hmm. when, we, when we're talking about, let's say, the art or rather the science of prediction, right, the, the pollsters, there was widespread criticism that in 2016, um, pretty much all the pollsters had got it wrong. Now, this time around in 2020, the pollsters had predicted an upset and the, they had predicted that Joe Biden was going to you know, had a very, very reasonable chance of winning, which is what turned out to be true. So does that mean that, the, that you know, maybe the predictive power or the capability has become better? Or, you know, how, how do you look at it? The polls are always uh, fallible, shall we say. Um, and they, they're honest about that in the sense that when a poll is reported, there's usually a, a margin of error that's reported. Um, and so it's, it's a snapshot, yes, uh, but it's a snapshot that says, well, the current state of affairs is this, um, but it could be as much as this, or it could be as little as this. Um, you know, there's always uh, error in, in polling. Um, and so the best of the organizations that look at the polls are ones that average the polls in some way um, to try to get a greater sense of certainty uh, by aggregating a bunch of different polls and in that way essentially getting a larger sample size, uh, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, and so uh, aggregators like 538.com, uh, which actually weights the polls by uh, previous uh, accuracy, um, and then um, even real clear politics, their poll averages are, are simple arithmetic averages of the different polls, uh, I assume weighted by sample size. Um, this year, the polls, yes, did better. They anticipated Joe Biden's victory. Um, but I think almost uniformly, the polls underestimated the support for the Republicans. Um, so the final polls uh, had Joe Biden with a much greater margin than he ended up winning by. Um, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of six or seven percent. Uh, he ended up winning by about four and a half percent. And even in the congressional races, where there are a number of races that were considered toss ups, uh, those turned out to be not very close at all. Uh, and so the Republicans did better in the down ballot races than anticipated. 
and even Trump did a little better than anticipated. Um, so the problem when you're a pollster, there are kind of three problems. Um, one is that there, in fact, can be last minute movements in the polls. There, there can be people who change their minds either in terms of which candidate they're going to support, which I think was unlikely in this year. Um, but more importantly, they change their uh, decisions about whether they're going to turn out to vote or not. Uh, and so I think that there was, in fact, a surge of uh, pro-Republican turnout uh, on Election Day, uh, and uh, that, was, that was unanticipated. Uh, so um, one of the ways that pollsters try to deal with this uncertainty is by weighting their polls uh, so that they get likely voters. So there's a so-called likely voter screen, uh, which is several questions that they ask uh, to get a sense of whether people are very likely to turn out or not. And then they weight the, the poll results by how likely people are to turn out. Um, and it's quite possible uh, that uh, people were um, uh, answering that in such a way uh, that, the, um, that the likely voters' uh, models were off. Um, the other thing that seems to have entered into the poll results, and I know this from a study that was done at NORC at the University of Chicago, which is our uh, affiliated uh, national polling organization, uh, it seems that there were a group of people this year uh, who simply refused to participate in polls. Um, and so we missed them. Uh, they turned out to vote, uh, but we missed them because they refused to participate in polls. Um, and none of the ways that pollsters wait were able to sort of bring them out. Um, uh, they had characteristics that were in some sense unobservable. So there seems as well to have been some people who were very pro-Trump and very pro-Republican in their orientations uh, who simply weren't part of the set of people who are answering questions this year. Um, where, where you know, the prediction of elections are concerned, you've come up with a set of sort of aspects or attributes that you call the fundamentals. And this is something that like really piqued my interest when I heard your Harper lecture um, from last year. So it'd be great, I think, for the viewers, if you were to take us through what these fundamentals are and give us like a broad overview. Sure, sure. Um, so yes, I, I employ these. Uh, they're, they're actually uh, from the work of other people, primarily my dissertation advisor, Steve Rosenstone. Um, let me share the screen a bit. Um, there are five uh, fundamentals uh, that we oftentimes will uh, talk about. Um, and they're essentially uh, partisanship, the state of the economy, uh, the state of foreign affairs, particularly whether we're at war or at peace and how, uh, if we are at war, how costly that war has been. Uh, positions, the relative positioning of the two uh, major party candidates on the issues, uh, whether they're closer or further away from the electorate, uh, and it helps to be closer to where the electorate is on the issues. Uh, and then finally, incumbency. Uh, so let me give you a sense of about three of those, and we'll come back and talk about some of them later. Uh, the first of those is partisanship. Uh, so one of the things that is very influential in the vote decisions that Americans make in elections is whether they consider themselves to be Republicans or Democrats. Uh, and it turns out that a very large share of the American public has some kind of partisanship uh, when when you actually push on it. So uh, a plurality of people, around 40%, 35 or 40%, when you ask the question about their partisan affiliation, will say that they're independents. But then if you actually push them, it turns out that two thirds of them will say, well, I lean to the Republican Party or I lean to the Democratic Party. And they, they do in fact seem to uh, behave as partisans do, uh, but as partisans who have a kind of weaker attachment to the party. And why is that important? Well, uh, Partisan um, identification is the primary predictor at the individual level of how people vote in elections. And so here we see in 2020 uh, that Republicans, over 90% of Republicans voted for Donald Trump um, and uh, over 95% of Democrats voted for Joe Biden um, and the independent split in a way that was uh, more toward Biden um, than toward Trump. Um, but things sort of came out pretty much as you would expect. Uh, in point of fact, the Republicans were less loyal this year than they've tended to be in the past. Uh, it's usually been the case that Republican voters are more loyal uh, than Democratic voters. Uh, second influence on the presidential vote is the state of the economy. Uh, this is something that people have sort of known or intuited for quite a while, that 
Uh, when the economy is doing well, uh, the party of the incumbent president does better in elections. Um, and so in 1964 and in 1984, uh, when uh, Lyndon Johnson was running for re-election and when Ronald Reagan were running for re-election, uh, we had economic growth that year um, of over 6%, um, and they, of course, won in landslides. And at the other end of the scale in 2008 and in 1980, in 2008, when George W. Bush was leaving office um, and uh, President uh, Obama uh, and Senator McCain were running for office. Uh, the Republicans did very poorly in that election. Uh, that, of course, was the Great Recession election. And then also in 1980, uh, when we had negative change in real disposable income per capita, uh, the uh, incumbent president, Jimmy Carter, uh, lost to um, uh, Ronald Reagan. Um, and then finally, and I'll come back to this, um, a third factor is incumbency. Um, so it's it's long been known that the most substantial advantage in uh, elections, particularly uh, legislative elections, is incumbency. Uh, people turn out to be unwilling to vote for people they've never heard of before, um, and the people they've heard of before in congressional elections are typically the incumbents. Well, that's not really an issue in presidential elections because by the time you get to September, pretty much people know who the candidates are and they have impressions of the candidates. Uh, but nevertheless, incumbency is still very, very important even in presidential elections. So the table shows that uh, if an incumbent is running for re-election, the incumbent runs, uh, wins about 70% of the time. Uh, and if the incumbent is not running for re-election, um, either because they've dropped out themselves or because they're term limited most often, uh, then they're between 30% likely, uh, their, their own party, the candidate of their own party, uh, is between 30% likely and 50% likely uh, to win the election, depending upon whether you're looking at the electoral vote uh, or at the popular vote. Um, so those are some of the main uh, uh, characteristics right, right now. So, for example, if I take just three out of those main fundamentals, let's talk about, and, and I'm going to try and see how that um, leads to the outcome of what we've seen in the 2020 elections. So, number one, let's talk about incumbency. So, we have an incumbent president, a sitting president, who is running for a second term. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the second one, which is partisanship. And there's deep sense of partisanship, definitely within the Republican family, to the extent that uh, a lot of the, the detractors and, and sort of critical analysts have started to call the Republican family uh, party the the Trumplican party, even after his you know his his moving away from power. Now, juxtaposed against these two is, let's say, the state of the economy. Now, Jan 2020 was perhaps in recent history, purely in terms of the economic indicators, one of the best times in recent sort of years, right? When at least uh, just going by the macroeconomic indicators, overall unemployment rate was very low, uh, healthy trade balance, nice growth, you know, lots of jobs going around, etc. right? Now, come September, October, November, as the pandemic deepened, it became a completely different story. Right. So what I'm trying to understand is, is there any way we can really predict or we can say that, all right, even if you have two or three out of all the fundamentals which are supporting a particular outcome, something like the state of the economy is in itself enough to derail that combined sort of effect of the fundamentals? Um, yeah, they work, they, they work in some respects um, in conjunction with each other. Uh, incumbency is particularly interesting because on the one hand, it is an advantage to be running as an incumbent. On the other hand, um, it's the incumbent's performance that is really being evaluated in these elections. And so um, Trump, uh, as the uh, head of the party in charge of government, as the person who's in charge of government, uh, stood to benefit uh, from a strong economy um, and then was really hurt by a weaker economy. Um, I'm going to share my screen again because uh, 2020 turned out to be a particularly difficult year uh, to get a bead on uh, in terms of making predictions. So I'm going to go back to sharing the screen um, and um, say a little bit about that. Um, so in, in terms of the economy, uh, the big problem wasn't kind of having a sense of the way in which the economy was likely to affect the uh, presidential uh, uh, re-election prospects for Donald Trump, the problem was figuring out, well, what is the actual state of the economy? 
Um, so once the pandemic began, it was clear that it was going to be a big impediment on economic growth. Um, and in fact, economic growth for uh, 2020 uh, will probably turn out to be negative. Um, so we'll have negative GNP growth. On the other hand, what really seems to influence people's decisions is less how the overall economy is doing and more how the economy as it affects their own finances is doing. Um, and so if you look at the, uh, the uh, horizontal axis on this graph, you'll see that the variable here is change in real disposable income per capita. So, so that's basically a measure of people's uh, buying power, if you will, or how much money they have in their pockets. Um, and even though the economy was going down, 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 um, in the, uh, in, at the end of March or early April, um, Congress passed a big relief bill um, that made uh, cash payments to most people in the United States um, and that extended unemployment benefits uh, for people. And they were actually quite generous. Um, and so, as it turns out, um, if you look at the growth in personal disposable income per capita between uh, the uh, third quarter of the election year and the previous third quarter of the year before the election, uh, it turns out that that growth was around 5%. Um, and 5% growth works out really, really well for the president. Um, and so, you know, the economy from the standpoint of the fundamentals uh, worked out uh, a little better, um, I think. It was more of a plus than one might have anticipated. Uh, for the, the president, any, any loss nevertheless. Um, on the other hand, um, I've said as well something about the uh, importance of a fundamental, which is the state of foreign affairs, uh, and particularly war casualties um, seem to have a very strong effect on presidential elections. Um, my favorite example of this is in World War II. Um, so the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor on um, uh, in uh, uh, December of 1941, uh, in the following midterm election, which was in November of 1942, uh, almost exactly 11 months later, uh, the Democrats lost over 50 seats in the House of Representatives and lost about a half dozen Senate seats uh, as well. So, so even in this really, really popular war that we had to go into, uh, uh, it was costly for the party of the president, Franklin Roosevelt at the time. Um, and there's evidence that indicates that in terms of the way that the American public sort of responded to the um, actual cost of COVID, um, that uh, they reacted in ways that were very similar to the way that they've reacted in the past uh, to our involvement uh, in wars. Um, and so the uh, president's management of the disease, but, but even more so just the cost of the disease, uh, I think were very, very uh, costly for uh, Donald Trump. Um, and as you can see on a year on year basis, um, the, uh, uh, the, the casualties uh, from COVID uh, outstrip um, any of the, the wars that the United States uh, has fought before. Uh, and so that was a major difference as well. Um, the president is held responsible for what happens on his watch, whether the president's able to influence it or not. Uh, the pre president benefits when that has been a good outcome um, and the president uh, uh, is, uh, is hurt um, by the performance that isn't up to, to snuff. I'm going to indulge in a little bit of speculation here. Um, let's let's assume for a second, right, um, that back in the summer when the initial bills were passed for you know the unemployment benefits to sort of bolster the economy. Let's assume for a second that what Trump did in the dying days of his presidency, he was able to do that in the back end of summer, namely uh, push back to, to Congress, to, to both houses, saying, all right, $600 per person is too little. It should be $2,000. Now, and a, and a lot of this is posturing, and a lot of this is perception, a lot of this is packaging, which takes time for it to be actually implemented and to reach the benefits on the ground. Having understood that, if he had made these kind of remarks in, in through July and, and September, like the worst time that the pandemic was like really deepening across the country, right? And you could see, you know, week after week, 
and the map would show red, which means the number of cases has, has risen over the past week or over the past month. Had he made those kind of statements, those kind of like, you know, come to the table and say, you have to give 2,000 people to every single citizen, would that have made a material difference, even considering all the, the, the costs of war? Um, well, it, it would have made a difference if it had been successful. Um, so the big economic uh, impact of these uh, relief payments or stimulus payments, whatever you want to call them, occurred in the second quarter. Um, so most people were receiving checks at the beginning of June, which is the end of the second quarter. And the year on change in personal disposable income from second quarter of 2019 to second quarter of 2020 was over 10%, which, is, which would have been off the charts. Um, mm -hmm. And then there wasn't anything else. Um, and so, yes, people were still better off than they were relative to the previous year, even through the end of the third quarter, um, but it was wearing off. Um, and to the extent that people are really looking at, well, what have you really done for me lately? Um, it, it was it was idiocy uh, for Donald Trump and the Republicans uh, not to have come in with a second uh, relief uh, measure in the uh, late summer, early fall. Yes, and, and even right towards the end, and of course, I know that by that time, the, the sort of election results had been declared and all the lawsuits were in progress. But when we actually had the, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, I thought that was another tremendous opportunity that the Republicans lost out because they could have said, look, we have done this in record time. I mean, there were one or two sort of these, these proclamations of miracles, etc., uh, by, by Trump in his sort of idiosyncratic style. But they could have really said, look, this is, this is huge in terms of advancement of science and technology, and we are doing good, and this is the best thing that we could possibly have done, that any government in the world could possibly have done, etc. And I think that they missed out on, that, on, a, on a very real opportunity there. Um. Yes, although, uh, although again, I, th I think it really depends more on outcomes than what you try to do. It depends on what you actually do do. Um, and I think war shows that. I, I don't think anyone thought that the uh, Roosevelt administration was trying to lose the war, um, but they were unhappy that there are lots and lots of costs to war, um, not just the uh, material costs in terms of, uh, of, of uh, men and and. Uh, uh, and, and weaponry and all those other things, but also uh, the effect it has on people's uh, ability to to make a living. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I think it, it would have been, uh, uh, you know, in, in many ways, the Republicans are victims of their own ideology. <laughs> um, so they're, they're sort of opposed to the government doing anything. Um, so in the 1950s, there was a U.S. senator from Illinois named Paul Douglas, um, who was actually an economist here at the University of Chicago. Um, and uh, he wrote an interesting book where he, he referred to uh, election years as the liberal hour. Um, that's, that's the time when even conservatives see the benefit of spending money. <laughs> um, but uh, as I say, the Republicans seem to be victims of their own ideology. Right. right. Um, and it's interesting when you're talking about the Second World War and talking about the Second World War. Um, and I never really quite thought of it that way, but now that you mention it, on paper, right, the, the British Empire won the war and, and Churchill was the big hero. But because of the enormous cost to human life and the economy, uh, Churchill was booted out unceremoniously and, and Labour was in soon after, you know, the Second World War ended, even though they were the victors. They were the winners, yeah. So, yeah, right. And uh, and and Churchill might have been booted out during the war if they'd continued to have parliamentary elections during the war, but they'd agreed on a moratorium on the right. on the right. parliamentary elections, and so he served longer than the five years that is the typical length, uh, maximum length of term. Right. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Exactly. Mm -hmm. If we come back to to the fundamentals again, right? Um, what you've what we've discussed is all of this is in the context of the presidential election. Mm -hmm. Now, let's take those same fundamentals and look at the, the Georgia, the two very crucial runoffs in Georgia that we had shortly after the election in, in Jan, and which, of course, um, both went the, the Democrats' way. Would those same fundamentals kind of hold? Uh, they do, but in, a, in, in, a, in an interesting way. It requires a little bit of explanation. Um, we, we've had a, a lot of evidence, uh, and in fact, this whole line of research looking at the relationship between the state of the economy and election outcomes actually began um, by an influential paper from the 1970s 
uh, on U.S. House elections uh, and showing that there's a very strong relationship between the state of the economy during congressional election years um, in every two years uh, and, the, and the state of the economy. Uh, but the way it worked, it, it wasn't, it, it, it had to do with um, midterm elections, uh, congressional elections being a uh, referendum, not on the performance of the specific representative, but a referendum on the performance of the president. Uh, and so, yes, um, I think we saw that in Georgia this year as well, that uh, the same sorts of factors that led Georgia uh, to go Democratic for the first time since 1992, uh, that uh, those same factors also weighed in the senatorial elections, um, that uh, the, the, the kind of dissatisfaction that there was with, with Donald Trump also translated into dissatisfaction with down-ballot um, candidates as well. Um, and I think we, um, you know, that th there, were, there were other things going on in Georgia as well. Um, most importantly, an extraordinary mobilization of African-American voters um, that was related to uh, Stacey Abrams uh, and uh, her failed campaign for governor in 2018 uh, and the way that she came back with that, uh, basically saying, well, um, you know, you're going to try to suppress our vote. We're going to get that vote out. Uh, and it was enormously successful, um, both in electing the first African-American senator from Georgia um, and the first Jewish senator from Georgia. Um, so 105 years since the lynching of a Jewish man um, in Georgia, uh, 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 Leo Frank, um, and, uh, uh, you know, not that many years um, since African-Americans uh, were, uh, uh, well, since, since um, a candidate for governor um, uh, was successful in politics by having made his name by chasing black customers out of his restaurant with the axe hand, with an axe handle. That was Lester Maddox. Slightly tangential question. Um, to what extent did race play a part? And to what extent do we, you know, are we in the danger of making oversimplification? So, for example, if you were to think that, you know, the, the Hispanic population is monolithic across the the economy, right, and across the, the populace, would that be a mistake? Uh, well, there, there has always been a racial, there, I, I should say there's long been a racial divide uh, mm -hmm. in voting in the United States. Um, I, it, it, uh, and it goes way back. Um, so white voters since the 1970s um, have typically given um, a majority of their vote uh, to the Republican nominee. Uh, and in fact, the high point for the Democratic vote among white voters uh, was about 45, 46%. Um, uh, so, um, and that was Bill Clinton, uh, a Southern uh, candidate uh, in 1992. Um, so the, you know, the, the whites have tended to be more Republican in their, in their voting and that goes way back. African-Americans have been overwhelmingly Democratic uh, in their voting since 1964. Uh, but even before that, they were very heavily uh, oriented toward the Democratic Party after having spent almost a century as the real core of the Republican Party. Um, so great changes um, over the course of the mid 20th century uh, in African-American uh, support for the two parties. And then finally, Latinos, um, since the 1970s, since we've had exit poll results to look at this, uh, Latinos have typically given somewhere between 60 and 65 percent of their vote to the Democrats. Uh, and that's pretty much what we saw again this year, uh, despite there being some movement of Latinos, particularly Cubans, um, mm -hmm. back toward the Republicans, uh, particularly in Florida. Um, that was offset by a movement of Latinos in states like Arizona and Nevada uh, toward the Democrats. Um, so overall, the uh, the Hispanic vote looked about the same as it had in the immediate past. So yes, there's there has been a kind of racial polarization of voting. Um, and as I say, that goes back uh, a long way. Um, what was different about Trump was that he was open about it. Uh, he was open in trying to exploit those racial uh, tensions uh, in a partisan way. Uh, whereas before it was always... Um, 
talked about as dog whistles, uh, ways of talking about race without obviously talking about race. Well, Trump Trump obviously talked about race. Interesting sort of thing that you pointed out about the, the Hispanic population. So if you compare, let's say, Nevada, which, uh, you know, voted almost overwhelmingly in favor of the Democrats, and you juxtapose that against what happened in Florida, it mm-hmm. seems to me that a fair amount of, of course, which was, you know, um, used to the hilt by the propaganda machine, uh, Trump in this case, uh, a lot of it seemed to have been born out of sort of ideological preconceived notions, right? So so people who've had, you know, experience with, with the Cuban sort of uh, the failed project of with communism, it was easier to convince them that, all right, if you're talking about Joe Biden, he's actually a communist, he's not Democrat at all. He's, he's, you know, ultra far left, partisan left, etc. Therefore, do not vote for him. You're going to have the same thing that you had in Cuba, um, as opposed to other states where, even though it was Hispanic, primarily, they didn't have this sort of legacy of, of the Cuban experience. Uh, that's right. That's right. The, the Cubans have always stood out among Latino voters uh, as being uh, particularly um, supportive of the Republican Party. And as you say, a lot of that has been that many of them were exiles from Castro's Cuba, uh, mm-hmm. and they were attracted by what they took to be the strong anti-communist position of the Republican Party. Um, interestingly enough, there's a similar difference among uh, Asian American voters who have been lately very, very supportive of Democratic candidates, uh, even to a greater extent in 2000 and. Uh, 12 and 2016, then Latino voters have been supportive of Democrats. Um, but historically, the most Republican Asian American voting group has been Vietnamese. Um, so it's been uh, Vietnamese exiles, people who were forced out of South Vietnam when the regime fell uh, right. in 1975. Mm-hmm. Um, that's changing. It's also changing among Cubans. Um, younger Cubans have a more favorable orientation toward the Democratic Party and young Vietnamese Americans have uh, a more favorable orientation to the Democratic Party than their elders, um, but uh, it still remains, they still remain uh, a more Republican voting bloc. Right. And and let's now do a, a bit of a thought experiment, if we will, right? Let's, let's take the fundamentals that you've articulated and take it not to a Georgia runoff, but beyond borders altogether, right? And let's mm-hmm. uh, consider let's say, the, the upcoming general elections uh, in India in 2024, right? Mm-hmm. And let, let's try and transpose um, the, the fundamentals. So he, you have here an incumbent premier or, or a prime minister in this case. Um, there's deep partisanship, which mm-hmm. is fair to say that that is going to remain over the next you know, three or four years. Let's assume also um, that the state of the economy is kosher, you know, more or less good, um, you know, better than what we have right now, which isn't, isn't bad at all. And last but not the least, let's also assume um, that we are not at war, right? That that there is some kind of a resolution or disputation of the long-standing Indochina standoff or, you know, across the border or with Pakistan or others, right? If we, if we assume, let's make these three or four very strong assumptions, um, what would that predict? What would that sort of predicate for the 2024 outcome, given your model? Well, I, I think it would say that uh, that the, the BJP is in a very strong position to uh, be returned to power. Um, you know, we there, there has been work on similar kinds of voting models in other polities, um, and it does seem to travel. Um, and... I, I think even beyond the uh, empirical work that has been, been done in this respect, a lot of which has been done in uh, mature um, industrial democracies, uh, United States, Western Europe, um, Japan, and so forth, um, there seem to be similar kinds of influences on the outcomes of national elections. Um, even beyond that, though, I, I think uh, in many, many countries, um, you know, it's pretty well known that uh, incumbents uh, will benefit from better economic conditions. Uh, mm-hmm. And in countries where it's possible to do so, they'll take steps to make sure that their economic conditions are favorable to their reelection. 
um, either by choosing the time to contest elections. Um, in, in Britain, of course, uh, they're scheduled whenever the uh, the prime minister declares them uh, up, up to five years. Um, uh, and so there's been a tendency, basically, if the economy is going great, you call an election. Um, and if the economy is going poorly, you hope that the, that the economy will improve by the time you have to have an election. Um, so, so I think that there's... Uh, uh, you know, a fair bit of evidence um, that uh, this is that these are ideas that travel. Right. And and what we've seen in India is, is typically over a five year term. Um, and in the first two or three years is where all the tough decisions will be taken. And yes. the last year coming up to the elections is where they would try at least um, attempt at presenting the most populous budget and have all of the kind of SOPs to the industry, as well as, you know, tax cuts from an indirect tax standpoint or even direct taxation. Uh, yeah, waivers, tax waivers, and tax slabs. That that's kind of what they try to do, right towards the end. Right. Um, so I have an interesting story about that. So you know, Ronald Reagan was was the great conservative, the great budget cutter. Mm -hmm. um, and so Ronald Reagan, year after year, would propose budgets to Congress. And that's not necessarily what would pass, but he the administration would propose budgets to Congress that had smaller spending than had been spent the year before. The exception was the budget that they introduced in 1983 for 1984, where they actually proposed an increase <laughs> in spending relative to what had been done in the previous year. Um, so, you know, even the uh, uh, e even the people who uh, have an ideological reason to oppose greater spending, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's still something to uh, Paul Douglas's notion that it's liberal hour. <laughs> it's it's time to be generous during election years. Right, indeed. Um, we go back to one of your books that was published almost two decades ago, right? It's called Mobilization, Participation, and the American Democracy. Now, one of the things that you outlined in that book is that you analyzed the reasons why people actually turn out to vote, and that you also analyzed why over time, over the last few decades, this, this, there actually has been a, a bit of a, a decline, a significant decline across the board in the number of people. Now, 2020, even though it was the year of the pandemic, we know that was absolute record turnout. You know, 74 plus million people voted for Trump, 80 plus million people voted for Biden. So overall, in terms of absolute numbers, it was a peak, it was a new high. Mm -hmm. So does that give you sort of reason for optimism that there is going to be more public participation in, in elective politics going forward? Or is it the case that 2020, both parties, the came up, they, there was such a huge show of strength because there was so much at stake. And particularly from, from a democratic standpoint and many of the minority communities, you know, democracy itself was at stake. Right, right. Let, let me share my screen once more um, uh, because I have uh, some information here about U.S. voter turnout. Um, so, so this is looking at U.S. voter turnout for all of the post-World War II elections beginning in 1948 to 2020. Um, and as you can see here, there was a period of time uh, starting in the 1960s and into the 1990s when we published that book uh, where voter turnout was declining both in presidential years, uh, that's the solid line, um, and in midterm election years. Uh, so those are the years divisible by two, but where there's not a presidential election. Um, and you can see a couple of things. Um, one is that voter turnout has been increasing in the United States in presidential elections. Um, since the mid-1990s. So the low point um, uh, of the time after World War II was the 1996 uh, election campaign when Bill Clinton was re-elected. Um, and since then, there's been uh, growing voter turnout in presidential elections. Um, and that has been driven, um, as you say, by um, a couple of, uh, of different things. Um, it's been driven uh, in part by polarization. Um, so we've seen a steady uh, increase in polarization between the two parties, uh, both at the elite level, both in terms of office holders and in terms of the electorate um, since the 1980s. Um, and the rise in voter turnout uh, helps to reflect that. Uh, a big part of that is people feeling like there is more at stake uh, that, um, you know, they're more strongly committed to the Democratic Party or more strongly committed to the Republican Party. They care more about who wins um, and they're more likely for that reason to turn out. Um, a second thing that's gone along with polarization has been that um, 
presidential elections in particular have become very closely contested. Um, we have not had a blowout presidential election since 1988, uh, since George Bush Sr. beat Michael Dukakis in 1988. Uh, Barack Obama won his election by around six or seven percentage points. Um, and Joe Biden um, is the second largest uh, uh, percentage win um, since that time, uh, it was about four and a half percent uh, uh, popular vote margin. Um, and when you have very, very competitive uh, races like that, um, then there are all kinds of people who come out of the woodwork who have an incentive to get people out to vote. Um, and yeah. so it hasn't just been people themselves saying, I really care a lot more about the election. I think I'm going to vote. It's also that the political parties and people like Stacey Abrams in Georgia have been out there saying, we need you to turn out to vote um, and helping to make it possible. Um, so there are a couple of factors, um, whether they persist or not, depend a lot on what happens in the next year or two. Um, but one factor was that it was certainly the case that I think people this year um, saw enormous stakes in the outcome of the presidential election. Um, so you had Democrats who could not imagine another four years of Donald Trump as president. And you had Republicans who were fearful of what would be the case um, uh, in, in national policy um, if Donald Trump should lose. Um, and so there was very intense commitment to these two candidates um, and people sort of feeling threatened in many ways uh, and fearful uh, in turning out to vote. Um, I think uh, that might be a unique circumstance. Um, certainly if Trump would run again in 2024, it would be there again, I think. Um, but I think it's probably unlikely that he'll uh, run again in 2024. Uh, and so some of that intensity may, may come off of things um, because of that. The other thing that happened this year that really helped voter turnout was that it was the easiest to vote in American history or in American history since uh, the implementation of things like voter registration around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. Um, so the access to mail ballots, the access to absentee ballots uh, was much more widespread. And so the cost of actually going out and voting uh, was extraordinarily low. Um, moreover, you had a lot of people who were sitting around at home um, and so it wasn't a matter of kind of taking time off from your busy day to turn out to vote on election day, you could just kind of do it any time. Um, so it's, it's possible that that could persist if there are states that say, wow, we made it possible for lots and lots of people to vote um, and we didn't have significant vote fraud. Um, and so we should just keep this. Um, and there will be some states that will decide to be more liberal uh, there'll be many Republican states that will decide to cut back on access uh, to uh, easier means of voting. Uh, so we'll have to see where it comes out in the end. But uh, uh, I think it would be better actually for both parties in the long run to say we should encourage as much voter turnout as possible. Um, but the Republicans are very concerned about what that would mean for them in the short term. Right. Indeed. Um, so Mark, we are coming towards the end of our program, but there's uh, a bunch of questions from the live audience and we'll start off with the one from John Duke. First question from John Duke, please. Right. Um, so that's the one on our screen. Okay. So to certain Republican senators like Romney, Trump apparently does not follow Republican values. If that's the case, then why are, you know, so extremely eager to maintain the state square? Right, right. So um, I, I think that there is some truth to that, that uh, Donald Trump has, um, I think, been different in his policy positions than many previous uh, Republican presidents have been. Uh, of the two parties, the most committed party to free trade was the Republican Party. Uh, with the Democratic Party, you had people who are aligned with organized labor who saw uh, uh, free trade as threatening uh, to their interests. Um, so uh, the, the previous free trade agreements have always passed basically by having a Democratic president like Bill Clinton uh, bringing along enough Democrats to pass it together with a unanimous vote from Republicans. Um, so Donald Trump turned his back on something that had been a core um, principle of the Republican Party since Second World War, uh, which was free trade. 
Um, immigration has uh, long divided the Republican Party, uh, but there is a very strong uh, pro-immigration constituency within the Republican Party, which is from the business community. And so part of what we're seeing in the announcements in the last couple of weeks on the part of traditionally Republican donors like the National Association of Manufacturers, the United States Chamber of Commerce, many business firms in saying we're going to punish the people who supported Trump um, in this attempt to steal the election. Part of that is the business community saying we have to take back the party. Um, which means we have to isolate uh, Trump uh, within the party. And then the third thing where Trump was completely different um, is that uh, the way in which he cozied up to the Russians. Uh, I mean, it's been the Republicans who who have been the ones who've been most hostile to the Republican or to the Russians through time, uh, and Trump changed that. So I think there's a lot to what Romney says. The reason that so many Republicans went along with it, was because it turned out that Trump was enormously popular among Republican voters, um, and they became very concerned about their chances of being renominated and their chances of being reelected uh, if they would cross Trump. And there were some early things that happened where the people who were most critical of Donald Trump uh, ended up deciding that they wouldn't run for re-election. Uh, Bob Corker from Tennessee. Um, uh, Jeff Flake from Arizona, uh, who decided they couldn't win renomination uh, because they had been so critical of Donald Trump. And so uh, there is a reputation out there uh, that uh, the Republican uh, voters are, are with Donald Trump to a significant degree um, and that there are costs of crossing him. Uh, and that's what people like uh, Senator McConnell and others have been have been looking at. You know, now that Donald Trump is gone, I think Senator McConnell is trying to take steps to make sure that he doesn't come back. Uh, and so, uh, and a lot of that, again, is uh, trying to sort of reclaim the party for uh, the kind of conservatism that is typically represented. Right. Indeed. Um, we'll, we'll have Oritro's question next. This kind of segues into what you were saying earlier, and I'll just sort of paraphrase. If you're talking about you know the, the cult of a very strong leader, the, the authoritarian leader, right? I mean, this is the sort of thing that you would you'd tend to see in sort of monarchies or dictatorships. But here you have a scenario where that was pretty much for his entire support base, the case for Trump, and even now, after he's you know sort of gone off from, from power, and uh, and I think it's fair to say that across the world that there are other democracies where you see this sort of closely paralleled. Um, do you think this is like a one-off scenario or it's purely in coincidental or is this a new trend that we might see for some time even across democracies? Well I think the Trump phenomenon is part of a common phenomenon across Western democracies. Um, we've seen similar things happen in Western Europe um, we've seen it happen a lot in Eastern Europe, uh, in those uh, countries that uh, were communist up until the 1980s. Um, we've, we've seen it happen as well. Um, one of the kind of harbingers of Trump's success in 2016 was the Brexit vote um, in Britain in 2015. Um, and the, you know, the, uh, Boris Johnson becoming prime minister and, and so forth. Um, so there does seem to be a uh, kind of wave of dissatisfaction with uh, traditional leadership. Um, mm -hmm. In that case, you know, the Brexit campaign was allowed by the incumbent conservative Tory um, uh, Prime Minister David Cameron, um, but it was he sort of felt forced into it uh, because there were elements within the Conservative Party, but more broadly within British politics with. UKIP, the um, the um, Independence Party, um, uh, the kind of pro-English uh, Independence Party, um, and and other elements, uh, really wanting to pull back from Europe, uh, and so yes, this is part of a broader populism. Uh, what kind of legs is it going to have? Um, I actually think we've probably seen the high crest of it, okay. uh, and that things are probably moving in the right direction. Um, the, um, uh, in, in part because <laughs> there have been some really horrible things that have occurred. Uh, in those countries that have had long democratic traditions, I think they'll probably come through it 
pretty well. Um, so in the end, I think things will right themselves in Britain um, and in the United States. Um, but there are places like Turkey and Hungary, which don't have long um, uh, democratic traditions uh, that uh, uh, that may well, as a result of this, have made institutional changes in such a way that this will be uh, kind of the new normal for politics in those countries. We've just come up to stoppage time, but we'll take a final question. Uh, let's have Shomiran's question. Um, it's a short one, but I think a fairly significant one. And and this is one of the questions that's been um, quite uh, you know, sort of a topic of debate and discourse, right? Given the, the problems that we've seen and given that, you know, there were, there were Trumplicans who said that, look, you know, in, in contesting elections and in having lawsuit after lawsuit and, and, and you know, going back to GA and, and putting pressure on the individual states and the administrators in the individual states, he is well within his rights. You know, he is acting out his constitutional powers. Nobody else has previous to him, and he's doing that, but he's not doing something that's illegal, right? Has that entire sort of harrowing experience of, of you know, court battles and litigations and, and losses and sort of all that propaganda, very, very negative sort of rabid propaganda, um, really spawned the need to have deep reforms in, in the elections themselves, in the mechanism itself? I guess I'd say two things. One is that uh, we've reached a point because of the pandemic where election reform has been tried and it turns out that it succeeded. Um, and in that I mean election reform that made it easier to vote. Um, so this outcome is actually an enormous embarrassment to the Republican Party and a threat to the Republican Party um, in its strategy to try to win elections by keeping people from voting, uh, by suppressing the vote. Um, so most of the talk about election reform is actually being from Republicans saying that we need to get tough again. Um, um, but, you know, the kind of the venality, if you will, um, of that position has been exposed. Uh, we just had a, in, an enormous increase in voter turnout, uh, largest voter turnout since 1900 in the United States, um, and basically no fraud. Right. Not only did no secretaries of state say, yes, there are serious chances that we had fraud. There are 90 U.S. attorneys, all of them appointed by Donald Trump, who can prosecute vote fraud in federal elections. And they haven't done a darn thing. Uh, the only person, the only indictments that have been brought forward were for a Pennsylvania man who voted an absentee ballot on behalf of his dead mother for Donald Trump. Um, so you know, we had an extraordinary clean election um, and, um, and, and very successful implementation of vote reforms. Um, unfortunately, the most consequential vote reform, the most important vote reform, would be in my book to get rid of the Electoral College. Um, this was not a close election. Four and a half percentage points, not a close election. But it was close because a change in about 60,000 votes in the right states uh, yeah. and the second congressional yeah. district in Nebraska yeah. uh, mm -hmm. would have changed the outcome of the presidential election in the Electoral College. Yes. Um, so, you know, that kind of electoral reform would be really terrific because it would force the Republicans to try to win the vote nationally. Um, and what Donald Trump showed is that you can, in fact, adopt a strategy just to win, you know, enough states to win in the Electoral College. Um, mm -hmm. But that has no serious prospects of occurring. Um, the, uh, the chances of a constitutional amendment are quite slim. Uh, and the proposal to do a kind of national popular vote compact where a sufficient number of states would pledge uh, that they would uh, instruct their electoral um, uh, college delegates, uh, their electors, uh, to vote for the winner of the national popular vote um, that seems to have stalled out. Um, it's a, there are they're, they're still well short of majority of uh, of states with a majority electoral vote. So I don't think we're likely to see that. I think we are that there will be some attempt to uh, try to uh, learn from this election um, and learn from previous elections, mm -hmm. and perhaps to promulgate uh, kind of model election codes um, uh, to the different states. Um, 
But um, as I say, I think the most important electoral reform is just beyond reach. Right. Um, Mark, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you. Um, and you. I, for one, have definitely gained more insights. I mean, it's one thing to, to be able to follow CNN and just, just follow them because you follow them as, as kind of narratives, as anecdotes, as, you know, as stories. But once you're equipped with the fundamentals and the data and also the, the interrelationship between the, between the data, right, the relative strengths and weaknesses of what can override what, right, in terms of these permutations and combinations that you articulated, you know, gives a much deeper perspective into the understanding of elections in general, not just the U.S. presidential elections, but elections in, in general. So it's been fascinating, and I'm sure the viewers have also had a large number of takeaways um, at their end. Um, with that, we, we sort of come to the conclusion of this episode. We'll be back again. Um, I'm not going to announce it, but it's, it's a big, big surprise. Um, our, our guest in February, when we will be back for the next session. Until then, stay safe, stay happy, and thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Bye for now.